Hey there, Pal Church family and friends. It is great to be here with you for worship. Whether you are here with us in the building or you have joined us online, gathering with one another is so important and we are grateful to be together on this day. My name is Brad Hyde and it's my joy to be one of the pastors here at Powell Church, but even though I'm a pastor, I am by no means perfect, but enough about me. I wanna tell you about who we are as a church. We are a group of believers who seek to love God with everything that we have and to love each other into a closer relationship with Jesus. We desire to grow closer to God and grow closer to one another through Bible study and prayer and worship. We wanna serve our local community, the city of Knoxville and the world, just as Jesus taught us to do. And then we are called to go, to go and to be the church wherever we're at. If that sounds like something that you would like to be a part of, we would love to connect with you. There are several ways that you can do this. You can go to palchurch.com and fill out the connect card there on the home page, or you can email us at connect at palchurch.com. You can sign up for our e-newsletter, download the Church Center app, or fill out the Connect card that is on the bottom of the info sheet that you received when you came in today. Share with us your prayer requests as well on the other side of that card, or you can do that online and leave those with guest services when you leave the building this day, or you can put them in the offering bags as well later in the service. We wanna be praying for you. As we prepare ourselves in this season of Lent for the most important day of our faith, Easter Sunday, I wanna encourage you to find a group here in the church that you can do life together with. You can find such a group in the groups section on our webpage or on the Church Center app. Or you may want to find a ministry where you can get involved and offer your time and your gifts to serve Jesus. Again, check out our serve card on the webpage or the Church Center app for a place in the life of the church for you to serve Jesus for Jesus taught us to do this. You can join me on Thursday nights at 6.30 in room 206 as we take an in-depth look at the Gospels, or you can be a part of the recovery worship and an open share group on Thursday evenings as well. There are all kinds of wonderful opportunities for us to grow in our discipleship as followers of Jesus in this season of Lent. Now, let's prepare our hearts to hear a word from God on this day that God has given to us. As we begin this new season in the Christian year that we call Lent, it is a tradition to read one of a couple of different passages from one of the Gospels. And it's where Jesus goes out into the wilderness and where he is tested. So I'm going to be reading Luke's account of this story. I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke chapter 4 beginning with verse 1. Jesus returned from the Jordan River full of the Holy Spirit, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and afterwards Jesus was starving. The devil said to him, Since you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus replied, It's written, People won't live only by bread. Next, the devil led him to a high place and showed him in a single instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said, I will give you this whole domain and the glory of all these kingdoms. It's been entrusted to me and I can give it to anyone I want. Therefore, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it's written, You will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil brought him into Jerusalem and stood him at the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. Jesus answered, it's been said, don't test the Lord your God. After finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the doing of these words. Have you ever had a true wilderness experience? I've had a few. One that I oftentimes recall, though, when I think about a wilderness experience occurred At the very end of my senior year in high school, 
the school that I attended, if you had good grades and you didn't have to take final exams, the very first week of May, they took the entire senior class from Chattanooga down to the mountains of North Georgia. And we camped there for a week. We had cabins, there was a, a mess hall and all of that jazz, and we did all kinds of wonderful activities. But the very first activity that you did was you got there, you took your stuff to the cabin that you were assigned to, you gathered in groups of five or six people, and they said, grab what you need for the night, put it in your small backpack, and get into your assigned van. And that's exactly what we did. We had no idea what was going on. And what they did was that they took you out to a point there in the mountains of North Georgia, into the wilderness, they gave you a map, and they said, okay, we are dropping you off here at point A. You need to be at point B here on your map in less than 24 hours. You cannot use roads. Good luck. Well, I was thinking, okay, well, we're going to have all, everything that we need. We're going to get dropped off on the side of the road. There's going to be nice trails. We're going to take some great hikes along mountain streams and everything. And we get dropped off, and there is absolutely no trail. And we can't walk on the road. And so we literally head off into the woods. A few people had the presence of mind to grab some machetes, and we needed them to get through some of the underbrush. Others of us grab some food because, you know, we're food-oriented. None of us grabbed a tent. None of us grabbed sleeping bags or blankets. They dropped us off at 4 p.m. We had 17 miles approximately, best on our best guesstimation, of getting to point B, and we were off into the wilderness. We made our own lean tunes out of sticks and twigs and leaves, we barely had enough food for dinner and again the next morning for breakfast. We made our way the best we could with our map and our compass. We came to a river expecting a bridge, no bridge. Had to cross the river, backpacks above our heads, water up to our chest. And then <laughs> remainder of that day walking and soaking wet clothes until we dried out. It was a true wilderness experience. It wasn't just a day hike. It wasn't one of those trips that you pay big bucks for and it's perfectly orchestrated and guided for you. It was none of that. We were dropped off and we had to make our way through to the other end. Have you ever been on a true wilderness experience? You know, we gather to worship Jesus every single Sunday. And it's good to know for us that Jesus had a true wilderness experience. Only three of the four Gospels tell this story. The Gospel of John doesn't talk about it at all. The Gospel of Mark tells this story, but does it in just two verses. Mark says, the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness. He was there for 40 days. Satan tested him. The wild beasts kept him company. And the angels waited upon him, the end. Mark tells us no more. Either Mark didn't know any more or Mark didn't think it was important that we know any more than that. So if you know this story and you know anything else about it, then you're probably getting your information from Matthew's gospel or from Luke's gospel. Today, we read Luke's gospel. And when we read that, there is this dialogue that happens between Jesus and the devil. Now, there's a couple of things to point out about this dialogue. First of all, the devil is biblically literate. The devil knows scripture. He knows exactly where to find in the Bible what he needs to put Jesus to the test. And he does. The second thing you need to know about this dialogue is that Jesus knows more than what the Bible says. You see, Jesus knows how to do what the Bible says, which is how he passes through the wilderness exam. Every time the devil offers him something, offers him more of something, more bread, more power, more protection, 
Jesus turns them down. Jesus says no to the bread, no to the power, no to the protection. Instead, Jesus is filled up with God's spirit. Jesus is committed to worshiping and serving God and only God. And so Jesus successfully passes the wilderness exam. Well, now, one of the things that we preachers do when we get to this passage every year is we focus in on what it was Jesus said or what the devil said. We focus on what the actual tests were. We focus on what these tests actually meant, and that's all fine and good. But today, I'm going to skip that part, especially since none of us are likely to get the same test that Jesus got. I call it the Son of God test. We're not going to get the Son of God test. We're not going to be asked to turn rocks into bread. We're not going to be given the keys to all the kingdoms of the world if we just bow down and worship the devil. We're not going to be taken up to the top of the temple and told to throw ourselves off and the angels to come and save us. That's the Son of God test. We're not going to get that. The kind of test we're going to get is the basic Adam and Eve kind of test. And at least as it relates to, to me, All the devil needs to really provide me is a cell phone, an all-you-can-eat buffet, and a wad of money. And the devil knows he has me at that point. What we're going to focus on today is the place. We're going to focus on where it took place. And Scripture describes that as the wilderness. Because, you know, location is important. When my oldest son one time was applying for a school and a scholarship, he had to go and take a test so as to be qualified for this school and this scholarship. And they told us that the test would be at the Webb School. We were living in Greenville. I went to a school down in Chattanooga. I knew where the Webb School was. It was up here in Knoxville. I knew it would be just about an hour, a little over an hour to get there. And I knew that we wanted to get down there and have a nice breakfast and and get his brain all warmed up and ready for that test. And so I'd set my alarm for a certain, certain hour. It would give us plenty of time to get on down to Knoxville. And so I woke up and I decided to take a look at the details like where we needed to park and the address and all that stuff. And lo and behold, I learned that there are two web schools in Tennessee. One is the one I knew about here in Knoxville. The other is in Bell Buckle, Tennessee, which is just outside of Nashville somewhere. And that's where we had to be. Location is important. And taking notice of the things that we have to walk through and go through in life, taking notice of where we are at life in those times, is important. I have a hunch that some of us have probably been in wilderness places. Now, it could be something physical like I have already described. But I also know wilderness places can be places like hospital rooms where we lay in a bed or a loved one of ours lays in a bed. I know the wilderness can be places like a cheap motel or a bar after you've been kicked out of the house or a relationship has come to an end. I know that wilderness places can be the parking lot when you're searching for your car and you got that pink slip in your hand. I know the wilderness can be the places like where the Ukrainian people are going now, having to leave behind their homes because of the ravages of war. Sometimes the wilderness doesn't have to be anything like that. Sometimes it exists right within our own chest. And when we sit still, all we can hear is the pounding of our heart or our labored breathing because 
of where we're at in life. Wilderness, it's important to be aware of where we are at. The wilderness can take many different shapes. It can have many different sizes. The only way of really knowing, though, that if you're in the wilderness, is that all of that stuff that you count on to get you through life, all that stuff that you think, this is what's going to protect me, the only way you know you're truly in the wilderness is when all of that stuff is gone. You don't have access to it anymore. There is no food, there is no power, there is no special protection. All there is is a Bible quoting devil and a whole bunch of sand. (laughs) You'll know when you're in the wilderness. Now, needless to say, not many of us seek to go into this kind of a wilderness, now do we? Most of us, in fact, we want to spend our time, and sometimes we spend a lot of time and a lot of money, on making sure that we stay out of such wilderness places. But I don't know anyone who actually succeeds at it, at least not for their entire lives. Sooner or later, Every one of us will get to take our own wilderness exam, our own trip into the desert, and that place where we are helpless and where we have no power. And it's there that we will discover who we really are and what's really true about our lives. Now, I guess that can sound a little scary, but I don't think it has to. I think it can be good news because even if none of us wants to go there, and even if those of us who end up there want to get out as soon as possible, I believe that the wilderness is still one of the places of the greatest reality of our lives because in the wilderness, It's spirit-filled. The wilderness is a life-changing place. And it's the most real place that any of us can find ourselves in. Take Jesus, for instance. How did he end up in the wilderness? Do you remember? The Holy Spirit led him there. What was he full of in the wilderness? He was full of the Holy Spirit. What else did he live on? Nothing but the word of the living God. How long was he there? Hmm. Weeks. We sometimes want to get out of our wilderness places as quickly as we can. Jesus was there for weeks. How did he feel at the end of it all? He was starving. Other versions say he was famished. And what did that long, tiring, famishing stretch of the wilderness do for him? (laughs) It freed him. It freed him from all of those devilish attempts for him to be distracted from his true purpose. It freed him from craving all of those external things that we think need, we need in order to protect and to save our lives. And it freed him from any illusion that he might have had that God would make all the decisions for him. 40 days in the wilderness. Jesus had not only learned how to manage appetites in the wilderness, he had also learned how to trust the Holy Spirit that led him there in the first place and the Holy Spirit that would also lead him out. The wisdom about the value of the wilderness is not something most of us want to learn. We don't want to go there. As I said earlier, we do a lot of things to try to protect ourselves from having to go there In fact, I think we would prefer to avoid any kind of wilderness, and we want to simply enjoy everything that we think life has to offer us 
with none of the challenges, none of the temptations, and none of the hard decisions that sometimes have to be made in our lives. Yeah, to those of us who still observe the season we call Lent, we at least get a little dose every year of what it might be like to be in the wilderness. And maybe we have reduced it down to cutting out sugars or sugary drinks, or maybe we've reduced it down to uh, putting the money we would spend on, a, on the newest Starbucks latte and putting that money in the offering plate. Maybe we've reduced Lent a little bit, but I think the kernel of the truth of this season and the truth of what Jesus went through, I think it's still there for those of us who observe this Lenten journey. That anyone who wants to follow Jesus all the way to the cross needs the kind of clarity and grit that only the wilderness can provide. From Ash Wednesday to Easter, Christians are invited to do without some things that they are perfectly capable of having, such as certain foods, certain drinks, certain experiences or trips or parties or whatever it is. We're also invited to commit ourselves to certain things that we are certainly capable of avoiding. For instance, taking a moral inventory of our lives or committing ourselves to the reading of scriptures or maybe having a lunch date with that person that we need to reconcile with. The word Lent comes from an old English word that means spring, And it's not just referring to the season we're beginning to experience right now where all the flowers are starting to come up as we march our way towards Easter. But it's a spring, more importantly, that refers to the preparation of our souls through prayer and repentance. It's the fertilization of our lives through fasting and self-denial. It's the pruning of ourselves through examination and the elimination of of old, bad habits. I was at least 33 years old before I learned that Lent wasn't about punishing myself for being human and giving up things like chocolate and ice cream and coffee. I wish it were that easy. The season of Lent is about the wilderness. A wilderness that is worth giving a try. A few weeks of choosing to live on less, not more. A season of practicing subtraction instead of addition. Not because your regular life is bad, but because you want to make sure that it is real life that you long to live. You know, remember when red lights used to be those moments where you, like, paused and you got to think for a second? (laughs) Not anymore. What do we do when we hit a red light these days? (laughs) We got our phones, don't we? Sitting in our laps. We got to return that text. We got to make that call. We got to check that email that just came in 30 seconds before we got to the red light, right? You know, I've heard of people who actually give up their cell phones for Lent. Can you imagine? I know other people who give up watching television during the season of Lent. I've even learned that there are some people who give up eating while standing up because they just force themselves to sit down at every meal and to stop and to take a moment to slow down. Of course, none of these things would impress people who spend their whole lives just trying to figure out where their next meal is going to come from. And I think it's important for us to remember that as well. But in a culture of plenty, I'm impressed that anyone tries to decide to do anything like that, to remove ourselves from some of this anesthesia that we inject in ourselves all the time to give up whatever appliances or habits or substances that we use to keep ourselves feeling like life doesn't hurt sometimes. 
Barbara Brown Taylor wrote that almost everyone uses something. If it's not an anesthesia, then it's a favorite pacifier. Whether it be murder mysteries, Facebook, or any other social media platform, binging your favorite sitcoms, the Pottery Barn catalogs, or the newest Starbucks latte. She says, I'm not saying that these things are awful. I'm just saying that they are distractions. Things that we reach out for when we are too tired, too sad, or too afraid to enter into the wilderness of the present moment and to wonder what it's really like to live our lives without all of these comforts that we constantly buy and surround ourselves with. Well said. The problem for most of us is that we cannot go straight from setting down the cell phone to hearing the still, small voice of God in the wilderness. If it worked like that, then churches would be full and Verizon would be out of business and the season of Lent would be about 20 minutes long. What we have instead are 40 days to discover what life is like without the usual painkillers, which is how most of us learn what led us into the wilderness in the first place. Once you take off the headphones, silence can be really loud. Once you turn off the television, the nights can feel really long. After a while, you start thinking that all of this quiet and all of this emptiness, in the worst case scenario, all the howling that you hear out there in the wilderness, you think it's a sign that something badly has gone wrong. That the devil is on the loose, that huge temptations lurk around every single corner, that there is no help from anyone or from any place. But if you remember to just breathe, take a breath, find solitude with God, spend some time in prayer. Nine times out of ten, you'll make it through that first night without any extra bread or any extra power or any extra protection. You can get used to the sound of your own heart beating and the rhythm of your breathing. You may even be able to sleep a little while and wake up a little gladder than you were when you went to bed. So there are 30-some days to go, you all. I'm not asking you to count them. As we say in the recovery community, take it one day at a time, one moment at a time. Again, Barbara Brown Taylor says, once you have reached for your pacifier a few times and you remember that it's not there, not because someone stole it from you, which is what I did with all three of my kids, not because someone stole it from you, but because you made a conscious decision to give it up, then you may discover a whole new level of conversation within yourself. Are you hungry? I'm famished. Well, what's wrong with that? Are you dying? No. Can you stand being hungry for a little while longer? Maybe. I guess so. Okay, so what else? Are you lonely? Yes, I am. I'm terribly lonely. What's wrong with being alone? Will it kill you? I don't like it. That's not what I asked. Can you live through it? Probably not. Well, maybe. I'll try. Our minds are geniuses at telling us that losing our pacifiers is going to kill us, but it's almost never true. All that's going to happen is that we're going to suck air for a while, we're going to get the hiccups, and then we're going to look around and we're going to see things without the pink plastic circle in our mouths, which is going to turn out to be a good thing, both for us and for everyone else around us. Again, Great words of wisdom. Friends, it would be a mistake for me to sit here and try to describe what your wilderness exam looks like and what it feels like. 
Only you can do that. Because only you know what devils have your number. Only you know the kind of bribes that get you and that grab your attention and that try to derail you from a life seeking after God. Only you know life's stuff that messes you up. That stuff that we think that we need in order to feel good about ourselves and to protect ourselves. Only you know what that is about you. Which might give you some pointers to the wilderness that you may need to voluntarily enter. And it's my hope and prayer that it's the Holy Spirit that's leading you there. And what I can tell you is that a trip to the wilderness during this season of Lent is a great way of getting practice against the devils that will come against us. Because they will. They will speak words to you, and sometimes those words sound awfully biblical. But you're called not only to also be in God's holy words, but as Jesus did, to do them. So look at your map today. Today marks point A. Point B is where God desires you to be. God's place of joy. God's place of abundant life. God's place where he desires you to thrive. There's a whole lot of wilderness between those two points. But don't be afraid. God is with you. And the Holy Spirit will sustain you. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whom you led into the wilderness by your very Spirit. Thank you, God, that not only did he resist the temptations of the devil, but that Jesus stayed connected to you, connected to your word, and trusted in all that is of you. May we, O oh God, as we find ourselves in wilderness places of life, may we also know that you are with us. And the stuff that we think protects us, <laughs> we just need to let go of it. That we are called to put our trust in you and you alone. We thank you, God, for our wilderness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We want to thank you for joining us online today, and we hope and we pray that you heard a word from God today. We also want to thank you for your financial support. There are a couple of different ways that you can contribute to the work and to the ministry that God is doing in and through Powell Church. And we want to go on ahead and thank you for your commitment, uh, for your love, and for your generosity. Now remember, wherever you're at, that's where the church is, because you are the church. So go and serve God with everything that you have. Love your neighbor and give honor and glory to God in all things that you do.